Okay, so I think this time what we're going to do is take a look at Hebrew poetry and rather than just talk about Hebrew poetry, I've decided that I'm just going to show you Hebrew poetry. Here's, in fact, what it looks like. This is um, Isaiah chapter 40. The first uh, six verses are located here in the bottom of my page. There, so You can see my cursor there with number 40. This is drawn from the Masoretic text. The Masoretic text is the oldest complete Hebrew Bible version that we have. It was developed by the so-called Masoretes, who were a school of rabbinical scholars who decided that in the art of preserving the Hebrew text that had been passed down to them, they would, in fact, add a very complicated system of vowel points. Okay, and this is because in Hebrew, as is the case with most Semitic languages, vowels are often not written. Okay, you know how to vowel a text you know, when you actually read it, when you actually pronounce it. And of course, it's presumed in doing so that you know the language. Well, if you don't know the language, you, you don't know how to vowel it. And so we owe a great debt of gratitude to the Masoretes for having pr preserved this voweling system. If you notice here that there are consonants here. Um, you can see them where my cursor is there, that there's a noon, a hate, a, a, a mem, okay, and a vav. But notice underneath there, there are little marks. There's a line, there's another line. Those are all letters, those are vowels. Okay, there are dots here, those are other vowels. All right, and, and what those do is the, those tell the reader how to actually make sounds in between the consonants. Okay, in effect, how to pronounce the words. The, different word will, of course, have a different voweling system. Now, that's the Hebrew in general. And by the way, the Masoretic text is important, I should point out, because your modern English translations of the Bible, in almost every case, unless you look at something like the Douay Reims um, or the King James, for instance, is based on the Masoretic text. Okay, that this is indeed the, um, the, the sort of the Ur text, the foundational text behind... Um, most every English translation, or most every vernacular translation uh, in the world today. And that's because this is the oldest complete Hebrew version that we have. It's not necessarily the oldest textual tradition. Okay, and so, so I, I think it's an interesting discussion to um, consider uh, whether it would be more appropriate to use other textual traditions. For instance, the Septuagint uh, is in Greek, but it indeed is based on a Hebrew version that, that probably is older than this one is. But nonetheless, um, this is this is largely the, the one that we have. Okay, and it's incredibly useful, it's very valuable, and it's, um, it's, it's highly worthy of study. Now notice that when you look at chapter 40, that the lines are indented. Okay, in other words, that it only goes a few words here and then it skips down to the next line but whereas up here and this is of course the very end of chapter 39 in Isaiah it completely fills out the line well that's indeed exactly as it is in your English translation okay this is why your English translation does what it does okay the English translators are respecting the Masoretes and the way they've classified this they've classified this in other words as poetry okay poetry has a certain breaking point at every little colon here is called or sometimes called a stick it jumps down to the next line stick s-t-i-c-h okay a colon just like the body part c-o-l-o-n whereas in a prose text such as this one it goes simply across the page okay so in other words with the uh, the poetry there's a desire to preserve uh, structure okay now in English poetry, obviously there's lots of different kinds of poetry. Uh, there is the famous limerick, I once knew a man from Nantucket who something something bucket. In other words, you, you can fill in the gaps yourself. There's a certain rhythm to it. Um, in a Shakespearean son sonnet, um, Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May and Autumn's Lease has all too short a date. You can see the ba da ba da ba da ba da That's what's called iambic pentameter. That's a particular meter that the 
poem observes. Okay, and all Shakespearean sonnets will observe that basic pattern. Okay, the limerick has its own certain pattern. Um, they, they, poems often have a certain rhyming scheme. Now, this is the big thing in Hebrew poetry. Hebrew poetry does not actually seem to have anything quite like a rhyming scheme. Or if it does, it works a lot differently. In other words, you'll, you'll hear when I read it, and you can hear how it sounds, You'll sometimes hear a repetition of sounds, but they won't necessarily be the sounds at the end of at the end of a word, the way a rhyming scheme would work in English. Uh, furthermore, there's not necessarily a clear metrical pattern, at least not one that lasts for more than a verse or two. And one of the great frustrations of Hebrew poetry is that whenever you think you've observed a pattern and it lasts, you know, three or four lines, you know, you get to the fifth line and all of a sudden it doesn't work anymore. It's it's broken up. Uh, apparently, there's a great deal of flexibility in terms of how uh, he, authors of, of, of poetry, uh, the poets uh, who probably function in, in some sort of a, a poetic guild, uh, putting together biblical texts like these, that there's a certain degree of flexibility and artistic creativity that they had um, at their disposal. Now, one of the things you notice here is that um, this first line here, this first colon, is broken into two pieces, okay, and, and that is indeed um, very common, all right, that's the basic metrical structure of this one line, and notice it's going to be completely different in the next line, there's a lot more text here in the first half to get to the second half of the line, okay, so these Breaks are here generally for a reason, and generally they'll be reflected by a comma in the English translation. Now, the English translation will also drop to a new line whenever the Hebrew one does. Okay, so you, you can see that there's there's a certain um, pattern in all of this. Now, this is what the Hebrew poetry looks like. How does it actually sound? Well, let me go ahead and read you um, the first three or four verses here, and you can get an idea. Okay, ready, verse 1. Nachamu, nachamu, ami, vayomer, alochechem. Line 2. Davgu, alev, Yerushalayim, vayikru, elochecha. Ki mala, tzava'a, ki nirza, avona. Ki lakach, miyad, adonai, kefalayim, bakol, chatatecha. Line 3. Kol kore, bamidbar panu, Derek Adonai Yashru Bahava Misla Leel Henu Mine four Kol Ge Minashe Bakol Har Giva Yishpalu Bahaya Ha Kava Mishkod Ha Kasim Lak Bik Ah. Okay, so we'll stop there. So you can see a little bit of maybe a rhyming scheme and a little bit of a metrical force to it. Nachmu, nachmu, ami, vayomer elochenu. Okay, so in other words, comfort, comfort. Nacham, nacham. Um, the, the name in Hebrew, Menachem, uh, comes from this. Menachem is literally a comforter. Okay, okay. so nachmu, so, nachmu, ami, vayomer elochechem. Okay, Elohim is... The word for God, you may already know that one, and Kem is simply a, your God. Okay, okay. Dahu alev Yerushalayim. Okay, very interesting. In the Hebrew Bible, it's never Yerushalem; it's always Yerushalayim. Okay, Vakhiru Elochecha. Okay, so Dahu alev. So speak, uh, literally speak to the heart of Jerusalem. Okay, Vakhiru. Uh, Elohecha. Okay, so say, uh, proclaim to her, ki mala sava'a. Okay, that your that her battle it, it literally is fulfilled, is filled up, is complete. Okay, ki nirza avona. Okay, that your iniquity uh, has been uh, removed. Okay, ki lakam yad adonai Okay, so. So he who has received from the hand of the Lord kafalaim double, okay, uh, bekol, okay, in all chatotecha, in all uh, his transgression, in all your transgressions, okay, we would probably say for all your transgressions. All right, so 
you get an idea here of how this 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 works all right there's a certain kind of a flow to it but it doesn't exactly work like an English poem okay and, and notice here also that the lines are different so for example, verse one here has one colon in it one stick okay verse two has three colons okay there's an a colon the very first line a b colon the second line and a c colon okay uh, verse three ag again you've got three but they're all very uneven in length okay Kokorei and Bamidbar Panu Derek Alunai. Okay, so a voice is crying. Okay, or a voice cries, however you want to translate that. Bamidbar Panu Derek Alunai. So, in other words, in the wilderness, okay, uh, prepare uh, the way for the Lord. Notice it's in the wilderness that the, the, the preparation is being done. It's not in the wilderness that the crying is. Um, the New Testament writers translate that a little differently. They have a little different textual tradition behind theirs. It, it's in the wilderness that John the Baptist is crying, not in the wilderness where the preparation for the way of the Lord is being done. Okay, but at any rate, notice that the the pattern is different here. There's three colon here. Okay, in verse four there are two colon. There's there's an A and a B colon. Okay, so so that tends to to change from time to time okay and from verse to verse okay so with that let's come back next next uh, video and we'll actually take a look at some real structures that you can look at in Hebrew poetry even in translation because the beauty of this is is that many of the key features of Hebrew poetry actually translate fairly well into English as fate would have it okay thanks <laughs>